I just want to say, it's been three weeks out of the pulpit, not three weeks off. <laughs> um, and I, I am like itching. When you read the verses in the scripture, when it's like, I, I've got this fire in my bones, I'm like, I just want to get back up there. Um, and really, just to say, like, I want to thank God for the joy that I get to be able. Sometimes the text is hard. I was watching a clip the other day, and he was preaching in Deuteronomy, and he's like, we're just going to skip that verse. That's more for like a small group discussion. <laughs> Um, but it is a gift, and I think, too, a, a, a picture that we really believe of how you can encounter God is the last three weeks hearing a message from different people. But just to remind you, this isn't my church, and it's actually not your church. When Jesus talks to Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're, Christ, you're God's Messiah, the Christ, and he says, and it's on you, and I actually believe it's on that statement. Declaring that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus says, I'm going to build, he says, I'm going to build my church. Not I'm going to build Thad's church or your church and not (laughs) we're going to build his church. He's going to do the stuff. And he says, hell can't stop it. Death can't stop it. And you look at it. It's been 2,000 years. We look at all the problems in the world and all the stuff. I mean, right now we say it's pretty rough, but like it's been rough, worse than rough in the past, and the church has continued on. And we have a whole group of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this out loud, we're calling them our replacements. That's the name of our kids' ministry now. <laughs> that are being raised up to follow God, to trust his word, to obey it, to serve Jesus. And the way that Aaron a few weeks ago shared was really good. I, we had a meeting after, and I was like, Aaron, I don't really have any critique on how you could have done it better. <laughs> You did an excellent job. And then Pat, a very different style of communication. He's far more, for me, sometimes creative. And I, but I know, we heard stories where uh, this gathering resonated and spoke to you. And then last week, Second John. I think now he's First John, because John Helms has rotated off our elder board. But John Hartman, who, from the time that I've ever met him, loves the Word and studies it and actually uh, God put it in his heart to, to hunger for the word when he recommitted his life to following Jesus. And you get to see glimpses of that. I love history. I like to lecture. <laughs> and some people are like, I don't know if I like that. But this is what I want to say is, uh, we are the church. Each of us make up different gifts and different abilities and different passions. And we're better off seeing God through the lenses of other people. I know you have a preference. I hope it's me. <laughs> but I just I want to encourage you and say thank you to those people. Um, and, and I did. we just had our, our first global missions trip to Mexico, which was amazing. Uh, I would say thank you to some of you that supported uh, me and Jackson when we went and uh, prayed for us. The Holseys went, uh, Pat and Terry, with four of their kids, and Tad and Lisa Fisher with two of their kids. And the easiest, I got lots of stories. I think the easiest thing I would say is the trip was amazing. The travel to and from the trip was acceptable. (laughs) A little long. Um, And one of the, again, with our replacements coming up the pike, I would just say this. uh, There were about 50 of us there, a church from Montgomery, my dad's uh, church down in Gulf Shores. Uh, My brother actually flew over with his three three of his kids, about 50 people. And I was, uh, it's been 20 years since I've been on a global missions trip, and so I was 20, 19 when I did the last one, and to see, uh, if you're here right now and you're worried about the future, you see the youth and what they're going through, I would tell you, go on a missions trip with the youth. Seeing their, I mean, they're paying to leave the comfort of their home to go and sweat and serve and sacrifice for people who are in a much more vulnerable condition than us. When Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, they did it. They were doing it. And it was shaping them and hearing their stories. Like There is such significant hope for the future of the church because of the youth and because I think many of us older people are seeing the value of investing in the youth. So thank you, church, for supporting them, for praying for them, and thank you for all of you that invest in our replacements. <laughs> it's important. I do get the honor of uh, bringing the word today, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 21. 
And you better bet we're going to bring out the book. So uh, we do this thing where we shout, bring out the book. I'm going to count us down. I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to be in Luke 21, verse 5. So church, three, two, one. Bring out the book. Let's praise him again. Let's praise him. Say hallelujah. It means praise God. We say amen. Like, let it be so. Your will be done. Let me pray for us. Oh, God, we need you. We, I need you right now to make sense of your word, to communicate it clearly to your beloved sons and daughters. God, we need you, uh, not just right now, uh, tomorrow. We need you in our homes. We need you at our workplaces. God, I'm reminded that uh, you're there, that you're speaking, that you're moving. That if we're not experiencing you, it's not because you're not present. Maybe it's because we're not attentive. So Father, would you give us a heart that hungers for you, a mind that seeks you, a soul, a spirit that is aware of how you're working and moving. God, we thank you for this time. Would we be, like Hebrews says, <laughs> stirred towards love and good deeds? would be encouraged by one another and by the gathering of our blood-bought brothers and sisters together to worship you. We do all of this uh, to honor you, to bring glory to your name. We thank you, Jesus, for the uh, unfathomable sacrifice. You came down. You surrendered your life. You endured humiliation and pain so that we could have life. Would you just let us see that a little bit more today? We'll never get to the bottom of that, God. You know it. We know it. But would we see it a little bit more? Holy Spirit, we invite you to fill this space, fill our hearts and our minds to move Move through me, move in the hearts of the people, some watching online, some sitting in this room. We give you this time, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So Luke chapter 21, we are making our way through uh, to the last week. Uh, verse 5 is, uh, for many of you, a, uh, you see the subtitle. The signs of the end times. And what I'm going to do, we're going to actually read all the way through 38. My goal would be to give you a few warnings and encouragements and then do my best to sum it up uh, without taking four hours. But we could probably talk about this for weeks on end, could we not? Let's look at verse 5, though. We'll read the first three verses. It says, Some of his disciples were remarking about how... The temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, verse 6, As for what you see here, he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, or called, I think it's called the third temple. As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Verse 7, Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? <laughs> the first thing that uh, I just want to draw to mind right now is that uh, buildings matter a lot more to us than they do to God. Now John just mentioned our building campaign. <laughs> and we're fundraising so that we can have our own space. I, I'll tell you, many of you are praying and giving towards the building. I've been praying and we're giving towards the building fund too on top of our regular tithes and offerings. I've been praying for a building for years. And as I've been praying, one of the things, especially years ago, was, God, would you give us a permanent space? And, and like in an instant, he convicted me on the word permanent. Because I can look up things that were permanent from like ancient Rome. And it's now a historic landmark. And I think sometimes in the future, they're going to come look back at all of our football and baseball stadiums and be like, what did they do here? <laughs> and, and no building is permanent. 
Even the best building is probably going to be torn down. Jesus here is uh, most likely prophesying the actual destruction of the temple that happens between 66 and 70 AD. But do you know what is permanent? It's your worship. The church. J.C. Ryle, in his commentary on this section, says, Let it never be forgotten that the material part of the church is by far the least important part. The fairest combinations of marble, stone, wood, and painted glass are worthless in God's sight unless there is truth in the pulpit and grace in the congregation. The temple in which our Lord Jesus delights most is a broken and contrite heart. Renewed by Holy Spirit. I just want to remind you when we get our building, because I believe we will. It won't solve our problems. There'll be a whole litany of other things. And it might be beautiful and it might be massive. The stones here that they mention in the text, Josephus, an ancient historian, says that they were 45 cubits long. In case you don't know how long a cubit is, I do math for you. A cubit is 18 inches. These stones that are adorning the temple are... 67 feet long, huge stones, as, I would guess as wide as this whole auditorium, and they're going to be destroyed. <laughs> and Jesus prophesies of its destruction. Friends, just remember that buildings come and go, but worship is constant. It lasts, it endures. May we see Jesus' words here as a reminder that the most important thing in God's eyes is not what you and I can see. Sometimes we marvel at, (laughs) but the most important thing in God's eyes is a humble spirit, a heart hungry for God, a people who are following Jesus, who are becoming more and more like him and joining him in the work that he is doing. Amen? Amen. Verse 8. Jesus is going to go into a lot of description, uh, not necessarily of when, but how, of a great church word called eschatology. You guys say eschatology with me? Eschatology. And some of you are licking your chops right now. Ooh. And some of you are like, what does that mean? So the word actually is, uh, the description of it would be the theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. It comes from the word eschaton, which is the final event in the divine plan, the end of the world. And for what it's worth, I want to give you a very brief snapshot of different views on eschatology, which many of you maybe don't have any view, and some of you hold very strongly to one, which is great. There's four main views, and they focus on three aspects. Now, one is the millennium, or the thousand-year period. The second thing is the binding of Satan, our enemy, the deceiver. And the third is the relationship between Israel and the church. Those are the three main issues that people look at when we talk about eschatology. And there's four major views held by most people. And maybe you don't have any of these views and you go, I don't know. The first one is amillennialism. You guys say amillennialism? It's a a mouthful. You're like amillennialism. It's like we went to Mexico with a guy from Mississippi. And you know how he said it? Mississippi. He takes out one I and two S's. I'd say it's because he's from Mississippi that he takes all those. Amillennialism is the first one. No literal, open, visible, 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. That's one of them. The second one, this is a very broad brush of what these views are. The second one is post-millennialism. So after the thousand years, the ever-expanding progress of the gospel until the world becomes markedly Christian, then Christ returns. The third is called historic premillennialism. So before, Christ will return physically and visibly to usher in the millennial reign. And then the fourth is dispensationalism. The millennial reign of Christ will begin after his return at the end of a distinct seven-year period known as the tribulation. There's lots of views. You probably have already forgotten what some of them are. There'll be a quiz later. Kidding. What? What I, what I found in my conviction, which convicted me and is a conviction for us, I think, as a church, is uh, we are not to be apathetic or arrogant when it comes to eschatology, but we must be a disciple. 
What do I mean by that? When I read this first, I, I read a thing called the Jewish New Testament Commentary, and there were four pages on a book that sometimes has a little segment. Four pages on this segment talking about how true it was and ma- mapped through the people of God from the time of 30 AD or so up until when Israel regained its status as a country in 1948. Some of you can correct me. After World War II, let's just say that. And they'll be like, this is the time. And I read it all and I, they march through like the, the Ottomans and the Romans and the Greeks and the Muslim invasion and all of And I'm like, I have no clue how I could prepare all of this in due time. And I'm going to be in Mexico next week. And so I'm like, I I had this conviction. I'm like, I don't know. And I don't care. And then I read this commentary. It says, don't be apathetic. So maybe you're here and you go, it doesn't really matter. The encouragement to you, if you're on that side of things, like I think I was, and I think the Holy Spirit convicted me, is don't have a lazy indifference which turns away from prophetic scripture on account of it being difficult. It is difficult. Some of y'all ask me to preach revelation, and I go, I'm not smart enough for that one. <laughs> but, I, but I don't want to be apathetic. I want to learn more because on the other extreme is some of y'all and some other people that claim Christ are very arrogant when it comes to eschatology. A dogmatic spirit, which makes us forget that we are disciples, speaking confidently as if we were the prophets themselves. So we don't want to be on the extremes. Don't be apathetic. Don't be dogmatically arrogant. But we want to be a disciple. Remember, all scripture is God breathed and is useful. And even the beginning of Revelation, a very challenging book says, you'll be blessed if you read it. As a disciple of Christ, I challenge you and myself to not shy away from prophetic scripture, to see that in studying it, there is a blessing within, and more and more clarity will come year after year. I say all of that (laughs) to now read eschatology. Verse 8, he replied, they're asking When's it going to happen? When's it going to be destroyed? Jesus replies, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, don't be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences and various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. This is uh, their way of saying like asteroids and, you know, a couple months ago we had the, you could see the northern lights like down in Alabama, like that's a great sign in heaven. Lots of them will happen. Verse 12, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues. And for the reference, synagogue isn't just a place of worship, it was also a place of law. So if you were in trouble with the Jewish people, you go to synagogue, and that's where they would enact a punishment, like flogging you, or putting you in prison, or torturing you, if that's what they wanted to do. Put you in synagogues, put you in prison, you'll be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name, and so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you'll defend yourselves. For I'll give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Caveat. (laughs) I've heard some preachers be like, I just get up in the pulpit and I let the Spirit give me the words that people aren't able to contradict. Every commentary I read was like, this is not an excuse for poor preparation. (laughs) I study... I read stuff, I pray a lot about it, I practice how I'm going to say it because I want to communicate clearly the truths of God to a people who are hungry for them, amen? I hope all people do that. This is talking about on the day when you're brought before governors, don't worry about what you're going to say because in that moment, you're going to be like, whoa. You're going to say stuff and they're going to be like, whoa. They're probably still going to be mad. They probably still might punish you, but they won't be able to contradict you. Verse 16. I know some of y'all have questions too. I have a lot of questions about this text, but let's keep going. 16. You will be betrayed. It's like it's from bad to worse. And especially for a first century Jewish culture, 
this next line would have been far more uh, terrifying, grievous. You'll be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. If you are still awake right now, you probably have a question like, hold up. (laughs) Because verse 18 and 19 just says, not a hair of your head will perish. But then verses 10 through 17 say a lot of bad things are going to happen. As I was reading it and studying it, it made me think of the Psalms, which is also repeated in Hebrews. It says, what can mere mortals do to me? And the answer to that is they can do a lot. (laughs) They can do a lot. Some of you are in life right now where mere mortals, not God, mere mortals are doing a lot to you. And so how do we balance this tension? You're going to be betrayed by your family. You're going to be tortured. You might be executed, but not a hair of your head will be damaged. Well, J.C. Ryle helps again, thankfully. Whatever sufferings, he says, a disciple of Christ may go through, his best things can never be injured. His life is hidden with Christ and God. His treasure in heaven can never be touched. His soul is beyond the reach of harm. Even his vile body, our vile bodies, friends, will be raised again, made like our Savior's glorious body on the last day. Yeah, there's likelihood of as this plays out, physical, emotional, all the psychological, social types of harm. But if you're in Christ, He's got you. You might be put to death. I I do my best not to talk negatively about other churches that claim the name of Christ, but when churches say that if you follow Christ, you'll have money in the bank and health, and you'll win the promotion, I should look at the first 12 guys. And if you read about their lives, they were faithful to the end, and the end was often execution for the name of Christ. I hope I'm not executed for Christ's name, but I want to be willing to stand to that very last day. My life is hidden with Christ and God, and if you're in Him, it is too. Your soul's not going to be touched. And if God allows something like that to happen, it's for a purpose. And we have to trust Him. I promise you that this is true. (laughs) Your best things will never be injured or taken. I think this points to the value of reading the Scripture regularly in your own practice. Maybe it's read it in a year. Maybe it's read a little bit every day, whatever it might be. This week, I didn't have my phone in Mexico, which was a huge gift. So I printed out my Bible reading plan, and I was reading through Joshua. And that's where we hear that his promises are never going to be broken. Joshua chapter 21, 45. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Two chapters later, Joshua 23, 14. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Friends, when it comes to thinking about these things, may we be convinced like Paul says he was convinced in Romans 8. He says, Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present or the future, or any powers, height or depth, anything else in all creation, nothing, friends, may we be convinced, is able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Verse 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you'll know that its desolation is near. This is where uh, most of the stuff that I read, because I am 
potentially apathetic and also not studied in this. They, they don't know when he's talking about the actual destruction of Jerusalem that happens finally in 70 AD or the second coming, but most of them said these verses are talking about the impending destruction of Jerusalem, these next ones. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you'll know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So he's kind of working his way out to the middle, right? So let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that's been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword. They will be taken prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will... He doesn't say when, but he says... At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. That word redemption is huge. Hey, if you're in Christ, you have redemption, but the fullness of that redemption is not visible to you yet. But when he comes again, you're going to see it. Your full and total and complete and final redemption is at hand. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the leaves. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer's near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, verse 34, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. Other translations might have dissipation and drunkenness, which they say dissipation is the things that happen after drunkenness. (laughs) Not good. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. Pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And I love the like super heavy teaching on the eschatology by Jesus. And then Luke tells us, verse 37, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple. Each evening he went out to spend the night on a hill called the Mount of Olives. Like heavy teaching, I need to get away. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So this text opens up A litany of great questions. My conviction in reading it is there are very clear exhortations from Jesus on how we are to live today in light of this. And again, reading through the Bible in a year, I'm doing the Murray M. Shane plan, which we actually read the New Testament twice. So I'm reading through Matthew again. And what I noted this week was that uh, Luke, in his gospel gives all of the be ready parables. Gird yourself up, keep your lamps lit, make your way through the narrow door, all of these things of like, be a good steward. And then he tells us of the eschatological conversation. Matthew does it the opposite way. He gives us the eschatology stuff. This section comes up a little bit earlier. And then he gives the challenge. So be ready, be girded up, have your lamps lit, keep oil, seek the narrow door. Almost as if to say, some of y'all are different. (laughs) Some of you need to be told how you need to be and why you need to be that way. Some of y'all need to be told why you need to be ready and then what does that look like? Whatever way, I love that the Gospels are a little different. I think they speak to all of us. Either way, there's going to become a challenging time at some point and you need to be ready. What does ready look like? Study the Gospels. I find in here uh, many more than this, but ten exhortations of how we're to live right now in light of the promise that something like this is going to happen. Because we could shy away like, I don't care. I'm just going to live my life. 
I don't even want to say it, but the cultural mantra of today is like, live my truth, which is just garbage. Or, I know exactly when this is going to happen. I know exactly how it's going to work. How do you not know this? Well, let's look. There's 10 exhortations that whatever side you're on, you need to pay attention because these are the words of God in the flesh, your Messiah, the one who laid his life down for you. He didn't stutter. He doesn't just throw out words carelessly like we all are prone to do. He says them for you and your benefit so that you can live life. First one, verse eight, and there's actually two in here. Look at chapter 21, verse eight. He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. The first one is watch out that you're not deceived. Our culture is inundated with quote-unquote truth about quote-unquote God. And many of us are deceived because we don't actually think critically about what they're saying. They make it sound really nice and compelling, and we go, oh, this is so good. But it's not compared to the truths of the scripture. We need to weigh the evidence. Do not be deceived. And the second thing he says is don't follow them. I've been watching uh, the story of Russell Brand. Have you guys seen this? Came to faith. Had this baptism moment. I think that's his name. He's sharing all these awesome things that I'm like, God is definitely in his life and working. Like, incredible. And I was watching one the other day. He was talking about the Bible and taught me something. And I'm like, bro, you're a new Christian. I shouldn't, you should learn from me, you know? And I had this thought, I'm like, I wonder if people are going to be like, maybe he's the Messiah. He might not ever say it. He kind of looks like it. He's got long hair. He talks with a cool accent, you know? But this idea that there's going to be a lot of people being like, I'm he, that means the Messiah. It's, it's happening right now. He says, don't be deceived. And don't follow them. That's discipleship language. Don't try and become like them and do the things that they're doing. You need to keep following your Messiah. Those are two. Verse 9 has the third one that I found. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. They must happen first. The end won't come right away. Third challenge. We said first, don't be deceived. Don't follow them. Third, don't be frightened. Fourth, verse 13. 12 says, you know, they're going to bring you before governors and kings into the synagogue, all on account of my name. Verse 13 says, and so you will bear testimony to me. Remember that the opportunities of your persecution is one of bringing testimony about who Christ is. Like, talk about turn the tables upside down. Like, they think that they're accusing you, but when the Spirit's going to give you the stuff to say, you're going to testify about the goodness of God in your life. And it's an opportunity. We're like, I don't want to be put on trial. I don't want to go to prison. I don't. But Jesus is like, it's going to happen, and it's a testimony. Don't be afraid. You get to testify. I'm like, can I testify like less seriously, you know? Fifth, verse 14. Make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you'll defend yourselves. I'm going to give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Meaning when these things start to happen, they might in our lifetime, maybe they already have in some degree, don't worry beforehand about what you're going to say and rehearse your speech. Keep following Jesus daily. Keep trusting him with your life. Because when that time comes, you'll have the words. Sixth one, verse 19. It says, stand firm and you will win life. All the stuff that's going on, everybody being deceived, everybody being afraid, you, beloved son, cherished daughter of the king, you stand firm. Seventh, verse 28. It says, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. It sounds like all the stuff Luke's been saying. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. 
Let, let, like, let your eye be full of light. And that light is the light of life, which is Christ coming in the flesh. Could we be fixated on him? When that stuff happens, stand up, lift up your heads. You get to see your full redemption. And then the last three, 8, 9, and 10, I think happen in verse 36. It says this, be always on the watch. Some of y'all feeling apathetic. I don't know anything about prophecy. It's out of my pay grade. Always be on the watch. Keep your eyes peeled. And the last two says, pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen. It's going to be hard. It's going to cause many to doubt, maybe some to fall away. And he mentions pregnant women and nursing mothers. Like, it's not going to be easy for a lot of people. Pray that you can escape. Pray that when it happens, that God will spare you all of the difficulties of it. And the last one, he says, and that. So I think it means, and pray that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Don't just stand. That's the seventh one in verse 28. Don't just stand up. Pray that you might be able to stand up. God, I want to be able to stand up and I want to lift my eyes to you when you return. I ask you to be able to give me the strength and the perseverance to do this. I, I want to read this uh, segment because it helped me so much to think about it. The main thing here is persevere. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Our generation, our replacement's generation, their replacement's generation. It's been a long time. As the kids say today, it's been a minute. They say that still? Maybe I say that. I read this uh, from N.T. Wright, and it was super helpful. It takes, I read it already out loud, practicing. So it takes about six minutes. He says this, Travel with me back in time to Jerusalem. The year is A.D. 58, nearly 30 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Many people in the holy city came to believe in Jesus in the early days, nearly a generation ago, and many of them are still here, older and more puzzled perhaps, but still waiting and hoping and praying. Things have been difficult on and off. Once Pontius Pilate stopped being governor, people hoped life might improve, but then there was a huge crisis over the emperor's plan to place a vast statue of himself in the temple. The threat, fortunately, was seen off. Gaius, the emperor in question, had died soon after. And then one of Herod's grandsons, Agrippa, was made king of the Jews in 41. Everyone in Jerusalem stood up and cheered. To be ruled by one of your own might be better than having governors from far away who didn't understand local customs. That didn't last, though. He too died, struck down, said some, by God for blasphemously, blasphemously claiming the sort of divine honors that his pagan masters had given themselves. Now there had been a string of new Roman governors, each one, it seemed, worse than the last. But in 54, when Nero became emperor, many people hoped again that peace and justice would triumph. All along, though, people in Jerusalem were aware of the political tensions building up. Revolutionary movements arose, had their moment of glory, and were brutally crushed. Some said the priests were secretly involved. Some said it was all the wicked brigands refusing to let ordinary people go about their business in peace. Some wanted an easygoing peace with Rome. Others were all for driving hard bargains. Others again wished the Messiah would come. Daily life went on. Buying and selling, growing crops, tending herds, woodwork, leatherwork, money changing, pottery, and the daily round of temple sacrifices, music celebrations, and the seasonal feasts as the constant backdrop. The temple itself was almost complete. The program of rebuilding begun by Herod the Great 70 years earlier was finally drawing to a close. In the middle of all this, those who named the name of Jesus, who still met to break bread, worship in his name, to teach one another, what he'd done and what he'd said were pulled and pushed this way and that. Some of them were friends of the ex-Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, now known as Paul. He had been here not long ago and had caused a riot. <laughs> his friends actually said his opponents caused it, but the word on the street was that riots tended to happen wherever Paul went. <laughs> now he'd gone, sent to Rome for trial, and he wouldn't be back. Peter, too. 
had gone on his travels and hadn't been seen for years. Others were skeptical of Paul. He had compromised God's law, they said, allowing Gentiles to worship God through Jesus without demanding circumcision. The leader of the Jerusalem Christians, the wise and devout James, the brother of Jesus himself, was getting older. And his prayers for the redemption of his people didn't seem to be answered. How easy it was for Jerusalem Christians to become weary. If the gospel was producing exciting results, it was doing so across the sea. (laughs) They only heard about it every once in a while. Didn't really always like what they heard. Things like Gentiles claiming to worship Jesus but not keeping the law of Moses. Their lives dragged on day by day. Friends asked them, sometimes unkindly, when this Messiah of theirs was going to reappear, and could he please hurry up, because much more of these Romans banging around would bring on a world war. And anyway, looks what's happened to the price of bread. And if Jesus had really been the Messiah, why has nothing much happened since? (laughs) Not much used to say that when you met for worship, the sense of Jesus' presence and love was so real, you could almost reach out and touch him. Not much of an answer to say that you've been told to be patient. 30 years is a long time. All you could do would be to retell the stories, including the sayings of Jesus, such as you find in this passage. Hang on. Be alert. Prop your eyes open. Physically, yes. Spiritually, for sure. Pray for strength to meet whatever comes. The Son of Man will be vindicated. And when he is, you want to be on your feet. Now travel with me to San Francisco San Francisco, or Sydney or San Salvador in the 21st century. You emerge from the church on Sunday morning, the Pentecostal celebration, the Anglican Matins, the Spanish Mass, and there's a world going about its business, or as it may be, its pleasure. This is where it struck me. Your friends think you're odd still going to church. Everybody knows Christianity is outdated, disproved, boring, irrelevant. What you need is more sex, more parties, more money-making, more revolution. Anyway, hasn't the church done some pretty bad things in its time? What about the Inquisition? What about the Crusades? Who needs Christianity now that we have computers and space travel? Before that, they said it was about electricity and modern medicine. And anyway, they say, if your Jesus is so special, why is the world still in such a mess? They don't want to know about the freeing of the slaves or the rise of education and the building of hospitals. They certainly don't want to know about the lives that are changed every day by the gospel. They want to load you with the cares of this life. And as Jesus warned, with dissipation and drunkenness, literal and metaphorical. They want to wear you down to make you think you're odd and stupid. Why study an old book, they say, that's never done anyone any good? The answer is the same for us it was for the Jerusalem Christians, nearly a generation after Jesus. Keep alert. This is what you're told to expect. Patience is key. Pray for strength to keep on your feet. There are times when your eyes will be shutting with tiredness, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical, when you will have to prop them open. This is what it's about. Not an exciting battle necessarily with adrenaline flowing and banners flying, but the steady tread of prayer and hope and scripture and sacrament and witness day by day and week by week. This is what counts. This is why patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Remind one another of what Jesus said and stay awake. It's interesting when you put it in that perspective. We're like, that's 2,000 years away. Like, is this still going on? But like, imagine. Like, they didn't have social media to hear all the stories that are happening right away of life change. They had to get letters that came maybe every once in a while. What do we do with all these problems that we're facing? We still have the same questions today. And Jesus' words are just as true now as they were back then. I'm going to invite our band back down to lead us in response. What I want to challenge you, friends, a few things that I highlighted, I want to recount. The first one about the building. Jesus cares more about who we are than where we meet. He cares about your heart. Maybe you're not in a great spot today. Maybe your heart isn't contrite and humble. Maybe it's frustrated and arrogant Maybe it's tired. 
You can ask God, say, God, I need a new heart. <laughs> David prayed it. Lord, I need, I, I need every day. I need you to make it new. I think the big challenge when we read a text like this is being on either the extreme. I'm apathetic. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have time to think about all this stuff. Or I know, and how dare he not say he knows. And what type of church is this? <laughs> I would invite you to be a disciple. Don't shy away from it, but remember you're not a prophet. That We need to be following Jesus and trusting the words. And he gave us clear instruction on how we're to live on Sunday, July 21st, in light of what is for sure going to happen someday. As our team comes down, uh, if you're new or maybe you haven't done this before, we have a prayer team. Because maybe it's not any of that. Maybe you've carried in the burdens of life and that's a real thing. We prayed for you before service, but we would love to pray with you now. And so as the prayer team, they're going to be in these two stations, and I think a couple people might be here at the front. It's a little bit easier to hear because you're behind the speakers, but it is uh, maybe more front of the room so people might see you. Wherever you need to go to receive prayer, we would love to intercede with you and for you. Would you stand with me as we enter into this time of response? We've had about an hour and 20 minutes of being in the community of God. Your heart's in a spot where I, I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. I know God's convicting you or encouraging you, reminding you. Would you just be open to how he's leading you? He's been softening your heart, but maybe he needs you to let go of it a little bit. So God, as we worship right now, I pray that you would continue your work in this space. We trust you. Holy Spirit, would you come?